recording. So welcome everyone to today's um, Jewish Culture and Holocaust Remembrance Group's presentation. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Geisner, the founder. I am so excited to have all of you with us. And uh, today's program features Guri Stark and Eva Marami from, and Guri's from San Diego, California, USA. And uh, Eva is coming from uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, USA as well. Um, our program today is Love Stories from the Horrors of the Holocaust. And I know both of these uh, guests very well, and uh, they're great friends mm -hmm. of myself as well as the group. And I think you're really going to enjoy um, this program that we have planned for you. Also, we're recording the program and it will be available this week, upcoming on the uh, Jewish Culture and Holocaust Remembers YouTube page uh, for all of you to be able to share and stream. Saul, nice to see you. Saul just popped in there. Saul um, Pincheski is from, uh, is from um, San Diego as well. So um, let's start with a little bit of a tech check. You know, we're on Zoom here. So Zoom is very reliable, but sometimes it's not. If you do lose your connection, just try to click the link again. I'm watching the admit screens all throughout the program and I will readmit you. We also are going to have um, Guri start off the program with his presentation, and then we'll have um, Eva uh, do it second. And then the joint Q&A will be at the end of the program. And so we will uh, continue to take questions until there are no questions. And so we'll go probably into overtime because this is a very interesting group. We're also excited to, uh, to tell you that um, Guri is a very talented individual. He's not only a business CEO, he also is uh, a painter. He plays the guitar, he plays harmonica, and he writes. And today we're so happy to, to have Guri playing Yiddish music for us for two uh, of our uh, intervals uh, and on his harmonica, which is going to be quite interesting to be part of. If you have questions, we want you, and I have posted some relevant information already into chat. So we want you to open up the chat, put your question in the chat. We're going to go to those questions first in the joint Q and A. And um, also uh, <clears throat> if you're going to want to ask a question later on, because we're probably going to have more than one screen, the reactions button, which is on your toolbar will be available to you. And I wanna, if you click on that now, you'll see that there's a little bu button that says, raise your hand. And if you look at my tile, you will now see that there's a hand raise. This is very helpful for me because I have to do not only admissions, I have to do a lot of admin here. Um, and I want to be able to get to your question. When you're finished your question, go to that same reactions button and just lower the button and you'll see it's disappearing. So I want to, uh, as we're admitting people, I just want to give a, a couple seconds, um, but we're going to start the program with Guri and Guri will give us a brief introduction to why he chose the music he has and, why, and he has some special uh, screen sharing to allow you to uh, be part of his uh, music. So take it away, Guri. Okay, let me start by sharing my screen. Okay, so uh, hello everybody. I do see a few friends, although as soon as I share my screen, you all disappear and I don't see you anymore. But uh, hello, my friends, and hello, everybody. And thank you, uh, Jeffrey, for uh, initiating this and inviting us. Uh, looks like a few people need to be put on mute. I'm going to be doing that in a second. Okay. Uh, I'm going to play for you today two songs, one right now and one later on when I'm done talking about my book. Uh, these two songs are Yiddish songs that I heard from my parents when I grew up. Of course, my parents, which are, were both Holocaust survivors, spoke initially their first language when they moved to Israel was Yiddish. And I heard a lot of Yiddish in the house, although today, um, I understand Yiddish completely, but I cannot speak one single word properly. Uh, so if you 
don't know uh, Yiddish, I'll, I'll read a little bit to you and then I'll give you the translation. The first song in Yiddish is called Eufenweg steht a Boim. In English, on the road stands a tree. I heard that it's a popular song written by a very famous Jewish Polish poet called Itzik Munger. Maybe you heard about him. Itzik Munger was very influential. In fact, he was born in Chernovitz, which today is part of Ukraine. Uh, and then he lived there. He lived in Romania. He lived in Poland for a long time. He lived in France. He lived in England. He lived in the US. And he ended his life in Israel. Uh, so in Israel, after he died, he was considered one of the Israeli national poets. Everything he wrote is in Yiddish. And of course, many of those songs were translated. So let me try to read it, uh, you a few lines in Yiddish, see if I can do that without breaking my teeth. Eufen weig steht a boim, steter angebeugen, alle fliegen von dem boim, zener sich sie fliegen. Dre kein Mariv, dre kein Mizrach, und der Rest kein Dorm, uh, und dem boim gelotzt allein, Hefker, far dem storm. So gich zu der Mamen her, soll es mir no nicht stern, will ich namen ein und zwei bold feugel burn. So this is about a tree uh, that had a lot of birds on it, but the birds left him and he stood alone. And this boy tells his Jewish mother, if you don't disturb me, I'll turn myself into a bird so I can go to that tree and stand on it so it doesn't feel lonely. And of course, the mother, Jewish mother, tells him, well, don't do it, because if you do it, you'll get a cold, as she's worried about him. Uh, so this is the song. I'll play it for you, and you can follow the translation in English right in front of you. Take off the screen sharing, please. So terrific, terrific. Thank you uh, again. And Guri will be coming back with another harmonica uh, selection after he finishes up his presentation. But first, I want to um, introduce you to, to Guri. Uh, Guri is an author, an artist, and a popular lecturer on art history and a CEO of a high tech company. Now living in San Diego, Guri, second generation son of, a Holocaust, of Holocaust survivors, was born and raised in Israel. He graduated from the Technion in engineering and worked as a CEO and in additional executive positions in high-tech industries. But what he likes to do most is writing stories 
and painting in watercolors at Gurry at www.gurrystark.com. Gurry has been offering popular multimedia art lectures for over 15 years. In his books, Gurry combines his knowledge and passion for art, music, together with survival stories he heard from his parents and his own personal experiences, all told in a direct and engaging way. And I want to encourage you to go to the YouTube channel uh, from the JCHR, because Gurry did do a lecture on the art and the Holocaust, which was absolutely superb and well worth uh, watching. So welcome for the second time, Gurry, and you can take the stage and do your um, presentation. Gurry wrote a book called Third Wind, and it's uh, and he'll be telling you uh, much more about it as we go. Okay, so let me reshare again. Okay, uh, let's get started here. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Jeffrey. Uh, thank you everyone again for joining. I see a lot of recognized faces for the moment that I could see all of you. Um, I wrote a book called Third Wind, but in fact, what you'll see on the cover of the book is that actually there are two stories in the book. The first one is called Third Wind and the second one is called Three Oceans Away. And today I'll tell you a little bit about the background for these two stories, why I wrote them, and a little bit about the stories themselves, the, the protagonist, and I'll read you a little piece from each story so you can sense uh, what it's like. Uh, but first, I want to tell you more, a little bit about who I am, because I am inside those stories personally, so I want you to understand where I'm coming from. Uh, I was born and raised in Israel, and I moved to the US now 36 years ago, believe it or not. And I recently retired uh, from uh, over 40 years in high tech as a high tech executive. I was CEO of a few companies. And, but all my life, I was very passionate about art and music. And in fact, I, I've been painting in watercolors since I know myself. And I have a website like I like was mentioned before, you can see it right here. Uh, and I've been passionate about music, although music is a little bit of a sad story for me because my parents, which were Holocaust survivors, had to do a lot with surviving in Israel uh, when they restarted their life. And music was not really a focus for them, even though I was really passionate about it and wanted to learn music. They didn't have neither the attention span nor the resources to get me to get me lessons. Uh, and in fact, I took my first piano lesson when I was 32 years old and I already had three children. Uh, but uh, the story is that when I uh, had bar mitzvah, my father gave me a few, at that time it was liras, uh, the old Israeli currency, and told me, here is your bar mitzvah present. And I took the money right to a music store. I put it there on the table and said, what can I buy with, this, with these liras? And the owner looked at me funny and he went back to the back and came back with a used harmonica and he said, this is what your money can buy. So that's how I started. I started playing on a used harmonica. And you probably know that harmonicas are not being sold used because you put it in your mouth. But that's the only thing that my money could buy at that time. And I've been playing harmonica since I was bar mitzvah. Uh, I started giving art lectures about 20 years ago when I decided to start giving back to the community. I felt that uh, art is a common denominator to all people. And because of what's going on on television today with all the ugly politics, I decided that my job is to focus people on art. And the more they look at, talk about art, the, the less they will focus on other things that are uglier in our, in our life. So I started giving art lectures and it became very popular. In fact, today I'm, I'm a lecturer also in the UCSD, the University of California in San Diego. My art lectures are very popular. I usually I get about 200 people in a Zoom lecture and thousands and thousands of them watching the videos later on. And I'm an author, as you know, I wrote this book. I have another one in preparation and I'm a poet. In fact, I'm going to publish soon uh, my first poetry book uh, also. So, so that's who I am. Uh, here are just a couple of samples of, of my art. Uh, you're welcome to go to my webpage and, and see more of it. A lot of them have uh, Jewish themes in them. And of course, music is always a part of my art. 
I want to tell you a little bit about my parents because they're also a big part of my book. Uh, both of them were Holocaust survivors. They since passed away. My mother passed away exactly six years ago and my father almost five years ago. Uh, my mother initially uh, was born in Poland. She was born in Lodz. And when the war started, she was 12 years old. So in fact, she, uh, her education stopped right there. She had elementary school education when she survived the war. Uh, she barely survived. She was in Ghetto Lodge and she was in Auschwitz. And in fact, I, you can say about her that she was saved by the bell because the war finished. Uh, if the war was a little bit longer, I probably would not be here. Um, she lost her entire family in the process. I don't know much about her story because she never was ready to tell her story in detail. So I know only bits and pieces of, from her story. My father was also from Poland from a place called Lesko, which is in the uh, lower uh, east part of Poland, right on the border with Ukraine. You probably heard the name Lviv in the news now because of the war over there. So Lesko is just across the border from Lviv. My father used to call it Lviv, which I guess that's how they called it at the time. He was 17 when the war started. And in fact, he took lessons in Lviv. He was very fluent in Russian. As you can see in the picture, he didn't look uh, very Jewish, as you can say. So uh, he was fluent in Russian, did not look Jewish. And his father, my grandfather, which I never met, told him at that time, something bad is going to happen. Take your stuff and run away into Ukraine. And of course, he initially refused. My father forced him and he found himself for three years hiding, escaping and hiding, escaping and hiding initially in Ukraine, later on deeper in Russia. And when the war was over and he returned to Lesko, Linsk they called it, he saw that he was the only one surviving from his family. Uh, they, they immigrated to Israel right after the war in 19, early 1946. They did not meet in Russia, in, in Poland uh, during the war. They met in Israel after the war in a kibbutz, which is where they restarted their life. And uh, like I said, I never had grandparents. <coughs> they all uh, did not survive the war. This is my father's family. Uh, the guy here in the center with the green, with the red circle is my father, and that's the rest of the family. Everybody here did not survive other than him. Uh, my grandfather, which I know only from this single picture that I have, uh, used to own a bakery. And my father, as a child, used to work in the bakery. And you will see a lot of mentions of that bakery in my story. And in fact, in the piece I will read to you uh, in a minute. And this is me a new child born in a, a new country. Uh, so I was one of the first children to be born in the in new independent uh, country of Israel. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that now. So I was born in a new country. It's a country of hope. It's a country of hope for the Jewish people. It's an independent country. It's a country that was proud and energetic and looking forward. And I'm saying all of that to you because me as a Tzabre that was born and raised in Israel, initially I had an aversion to Holocaust stories. For a while, I felt that focusing on Holocaust is really taking us back to the bad times. I wanted to focus forward. I wanted to look into the future. That's what I was educated to do. That's the atmosphere around me. And I did not like to hear much about Holocaust stories. Today, I hate that period of time. Things completely changed in my mind. Uh, when I turned about 50, <coughs> I became a grandfather at 50. I was a father at 25. My daughter was a mother at 25. So I had my first grandchild when I was 50. And that created a change in my um, mental uh, thinking. Uh, and I would became very interested in my parents' life stories. And I started reading and researching everything I could get my hands on that relates to the Holocaust stories and documenting it. <clears throat> and I became very active in the local community about Holocaust awareness, especially for children like the age of my grandchildren. Uh, and then I composed a lecture because my focus was art and I gave art lectures. I said, you know, a very interesting perspective on the Holocaust will be to show art that was produced, created 
by either survivors after the Holocaust or during the Holocaust, or people that did not survive that painted it in the ghettos or in the concentration camps, which was an amazing thing to do at the time because they were risking their life to do that. And you see a fantastic story of the Holocaust through those paintings. And that's one of my most popular lectures that I give today is about the art of the Holocaust. And because of all of that, because of the change in my life, I decided to write a book. And that's kind of a way for me to compensate about all those years that I did not focus on the Holocaust, was to take the stories that I did hear, mostly for my father, a little bit for my mother, and weave them into a story, into a fictional story. The story is fictional. It's not a biography of any type. Uh, but uh, it has all of those stories embedded into them. The other thing I want to mention to you today is the fact that, you know, I'm a second generation, obviously, what we call second generation. Uh, unfortunately, the number of survivors that still exist is going down and the role of the second generation is growing more and more and more to continue to tell the story. So I feel some burden on my shoulders to continue to tell those stories uh, because I'm a second generation. But as part of being a second generation, there is something else going on. I call it PTSD, that's kind of a more modern way of talking about it, but I'm pretty sure my mother had PTSD that related to the war. I think my father too. And I quick, keep questioning myself, do I have that too? And there is a lot of research out there about PTSD for second generation people, which they kind of inherited through the behavior of their parents. So my mother mostly and my father too uh, had that PTSD type of behavior, always worried, worried about what? Worried about lack, lack of something, lack of food, lack of money, lack of access to education, because who knows what will happen tomorrow, kind of this type of attitude. So they were forcing me to eat now because who knows if I'll have food tomorrow. They were storing foods, quantities and quantities of food, unbelievable. They, had, they hide money in drawers. My mother used to hide money in drawers because who knows what will happen tomorrow. She collected dolls. My house was full of little dolls. I mean, dozens and dozens and dozens of little dolls. And I kept my, asking myself, why is a grown woman collecting dolls until it dawned on me? It's her childhood that she lost because of the war. She is still, wait, she is still looking for those pieces of childhood and she was collecting dolls. She was also collecting candy and chocolate, tons and tons of candy and chocolate. Why? Probably because she didn't have that. And one thing that uh, is typical probably of any Jewish mother is the bear hug. And I can see the phenomena, including on me, of second generation children getting away from that bear hug because sometimes it's a little bit overbearing, the bear hug. Uh, so that's kind of a little bit of the background for that story, for the story. The protagonists in my stories are uh, artists. Why? Because I'm an artist and I am present in every single character, not in one character. And it's not about me. I'm present in everybody in the story. There is a little bit of me in each of them. There is also a little bit of my life stories in them. I was born in Israel. I now live here. I went away. I keep asking myself why. Uh, there may be something that relates to that second generation phenomena. And of course, my stories, the stories I heard from my father mostly and from my mother are sprinkled throughout that because my protagonists are Holocaust survivors. Uh, but it's a love story. It's a love story with the Holocaust in the background. So it's not a Holocaust story, it's not a documentary, but there is a Holocaust spirit in, in those stories. And because I love history, Historical events, true historical, worldwide historical events are embedded in those stories too. You'll see that my stories go over multiple locations. The first story is in Poland, in Israel, and in the USA. And you see the activities, the historical activities of these countries are embedded into the stories. And the second story is in, started in Poland and then United States and then Argentina and then Australia. And you'll see the history of them is also there. And of course, something I must say is because my passion is history of art, and I know a little bit about history of art, my history of art perspective is also included in those stories. 
So let's talk about the first book. The first book is called, the first story is called Third Wing. What's the meaning of that name? So I think we all know what second wing means. In fact, I, I went to the dictionary to find the definition for second wing. And the definition is a new strength or a new burst of energy to continue an effort after the initial burst diminished. So this is a person that had a third wind in his life. And you need this moment to stop and ask yourself, so what was the first and the second wind of this specific person? And we'll talk about that. I also want to mention to you the, the graphics on the cover of the book. Uh, if you notice the cover of the book, there are there is a tree. And if you know below the tree, there is a, a mirror image of that same tree that looks like it's the roots of that tree. I want to read to you what I wrote in the first page of the book. This is called generational trees. One tree erect and tall above the ground, the other deep underground functioning as it roots. To me as a second generation son to Holocaust survivors, the two trees symbolize the relationship between the two generations. One, the shadow of the other one building on top of the other, one growing from the other, one providing the roots and foundation for the other. So that's really the essence of, of my book. The main protagonist of Third Wind is called Adam. Adam Kaminsky, we'll call him Adam. Adam is an old man. He lives in a house in a village in Israel called Rosh Pina. It's a little village in the north of Israel, if you heard about it. His house is on top of a hill, very secluded. He is kind of a miserable person. Uh, he is uh, secluded. Nobody knocks on his door because the few times that initially people knocked on his door, he was screaming at them and he was upset at them. So nobody wants to get close to this guy. They call him the crazy old guy on top of the hill. You, you learn quickly that his wife passed away. <clears throat> and you learn about that because he paints her portrait. In fact, every anniversary of the year she passed away, he paints her portrait. He loved her, of course, very much. It was, she was the love of his life. And the story starts, the day when the story starts, he's in the middle of painting her portrait. And suddenly there is a knock on the door. Nobody was knocking on that door for such a long time. He is disturbed now. You have, you're disturbing me from the most important thing. I'm painting the portrait of my beloved wife. He runs to the door, open the door, ready to scream. And there is a young man standing there. He says, my name is Daniel, I'm your grandson. Oh, oh, he didn't even know he has a grandson. And this grandson bursts into the house with a lot of energy and he walks around and he disturbs the atmosphere. And the whole story is about the relationship between them because through the relationship between them, as it develops, through the conversation between them, you learn about the both of them. You learn about the old man. You learn about the two loves he used to have in Poland initially and in Israel. You learn about his horrible Holocaust experience. You learn about his daughter that was born in Israel and that left him to move to San Francisco and you ask yourself why, and through the story, you try to understand why. And they lost touch, and suddenly the grandson comes in, and they talk. And the interesting situation there is that you have three generations. You have a Holocaust survivor, you have a second generation daughter, and you have a third generation grandson, and they all bring a different perspective about their lives with the Holocaust in the background. And you learn about those values and the differences and the similarities between them and you start connecting with them. And it's Daniel that helps Adam reconnect with life and start a third wind. Let me read to you a section. Adam and Daniel are talking. Adam is telling Daniel a story. Uh, and now the relationship is a little bit opening up. My father owned the bakery. It had been in our family for a few generations. So he, he inherited it from his father and learned from him the baking trade and the secret recipes that made our breads and cookies so famous. Like my father and the rest of my brothers, I grew up working in the bakery. 
I love the sweet smell of fresh bread, and I was always amazed to see how it rose from a flat piece of dough to a puffy swollen loaf. Have you ever visited a bakery early in the morning, right after they open? He asked Daniel. The smell is intoxicating, don't you agree? But he didn't wait for Daniel to answer and continued. I especially like the braiding, like braiding the Friday night challah bread. I worked diligently on forming perfect looking long and skinny strings of dough, weaving them together in a zigzag action into a loaf of challah seemed to me like a work of art. That's how I looked at the Finnish challah when they came out of the oven shining in a golden pan. I admired them like a sculptor marveling at his beautiful, beautifully carved sculptures. Every Friday morning, I also created one small challah the size of a sweet roll just for myself. And I put it in the oven with confident hands together with the grown-up challahs. That was the moment I liked most every week, the moment that my own little challah came out of the oven. My own tender, delicious treat with the light brown tan and the smell of heaven. This was the smell of Shabbat for me. Adam stopped again, this time taking a deep breath as if he was preparing himself for a difficult drill. In early 1939, when I was almost 19, everything changed. I started noticing significant anti-Jewish sentiments around me. It may have been out there all along, but I was blind to it. I was probably too young to understand. But in early 1939, it hit me and my family right in the face, or should I say, right in the middle of our hearts. One Friday afternoon, just before our bakery was closed for Shabbat, it was broken into and looted. And so was our house, which was right above it. I had heard about Jewish store raiding, and I had some concerns about it, but it always happened to someone else, and it was far away from us. So my father kept telling me not to worry and to keep the focus on creating great bread products. The sun continued its drop behind the hills, and the living room turned darker, but it didn't bother Adam since his eyes were closed as he was talking. On that Friday afternoon, I returned from delivering bread to a, to a few families, and when I saw the bakery, I couldn't believe my eyes. The savages destroyed everything. They broke everything. They smashed every bread machine, shattered every piece of glass, and cracked every piece of furniture. Our bakery looked like a live animal that was just slaughtered, with its guts spilling all over the floor. It was horrible. I think I screamed, or maybe it was a silent cry. To be honest, I don't remember how I behaved. Daniel sat there silently, watching Adam's face and not saying a word, the moisture under his eyes revealing his emotions. This was the bakery that had given us strength and fame and friendship, Adam continued. And now it was completely gone, wrecked from, the, from top to bottom, kaput. My entire family was shocked, walking, moving among the wreckage, looking, digging, I wasn't sure what they were looking for, Adam sighed and continued. But the worst sight was that of my father, he said, as a single heavy tear came down his right cheek. He was lying on the floor, petrified, holding on to a burnt loaf of bread. He was almost hugging it, collapsing onto it as if it was a precious metal. His clothes were torn and it looked like he was physically harmed. There were a few stains of blood on his white shirt. He wasn't crying. He did not say a word. His eyes were closed, and he looked as if somebody just pulled the power plug out of him. He was frozen. I can tell you, Yelid, the sight of my father, so frail and helpless, is a memory that I could never remove from my mind. It had been haunting me all my life, and even today, it still comes back to me in nightmarish dreams. Daniel sat there as if hypnotized in part because he was amazed to see how the old man had opened up to him and told him such a personal story. And in part, he was startled by the horrifying story itself. He lost his energetic smile, but he stayed completely attentive, his eyes asking Adam to go on with the story. That was the first story, third wind. The second story is a little bit different, <clears throat> three oceans away. It's about the intersection again of two lives. Their lives are so different and so conflicting that otherwise they would never connect. Two different perspectives on life. 
and on historical events, two people looking at things from a different perspective. And the characters, after they meet, they learn from each other and they learn to share their traumas and they change themselves through those meetings. The name is Three Oceans Away. And to explain to you why I chose this name, I want to tell you about the protagonist, Leonora. Leonora, on her 60th birthday, decided to leave everything behind and move to the other side of the world, as, as far away as she could from her source of pain, three oceans away from her source of pain. This is quite an extreme move, right? And you ask yourself, why? <clears throat> and I'm not going to tell you much. I want you to read it. And I want you to learn who is Leonora, which we call in the story Leo. Her father was Leo, and she was called after her father, Leonora. By the way, my name is Guri, which is uh, a son of a lion. And my, my grandfather, which I never met, was called Leibale, Leib, which is a lion. So why, uh, and why did she run away? Why did she move away? Why did she decide to write the story? Because at the end, you realize that the whole story is written by her, told about by her to her family. Leonora is an artist. She originally is from Krakow in Poland. She is a Holocaust survivor. She was a child <coughs> during the Holocaust. What was her experience? How did she survive? I'll let you read that in the story. But after the war, she had the opportunity to move to the United States. Her husband, which she uh, married after the war, uh, got a job and she was one of the lucky ones that could live Europe and moved to the United States after the Holocaust. But her life there was not very easy, obviously. She already had two children when she moved and the third child was born there. But her first child, Benji, uh, was uh, a little bit problematic. He was autistic. And she as a Jewish mother with PTSD was overly protective of him, which she was one of the sources of stress in that story. And when she moved away, uh, to the other side of the world, to a little place called Cooktown in Australia, she met a man, Maury. So who is Maury? Maury uh, was born in Germany. He is an author, he writes books. He moved from Germany to Buenos Aires. And there he met a woman, Argentinian. They married, uh, he had a son, and then he got divorced. And why, you'll have to read to learn. It was a little bit stress in his family too, and he got divorced. And when he got divorced, and because of the stress of the family, he wanted to run away too. And he, he ran away to Australia, initially to Brisbane, and then decided Brisbane is too big. He wanted something more remote, and he moved to Cooktown. And this is where he met Leonora in the library in Cooktown. And the two of them have a lot of things in common, right? They both have a wish to run away from their past. They wanted both to start a new life someplace else away from everything. They both felt like outsiders initially in these new locations for different reasons. Um, they both have a son that committed suicide. That's a spoiler alert. Each of them for different reasons. I'll let you figure out why. They both had a problematic relationship, mother-son and father-son relationship, which was a little bit behind the reasons for this suicide. And here I'll read you a, a, a paragraph also to understand the background. This is Leonora talking. The library did not contain many books. When the entire town has fewer than 3,000 people, the demand for books is not remarkably high but there were more than enough books for my needs. And it had the calm atmosphere and captivating smell of printed pages that I, I had always loved. I would sit there for hours reading a book or magazine or the front page of the Mirage News, the local daily newspaper. To me, reading the newspaper was essential. It was my only source of information, but I always remembered the words of Mark Twain. If you don't read the newspaper, you are uninformed. If you read a newspaper, you are misinformed. 
oh, and the name of this newspaper, the Mirage News, was probably telling. I always wondered about the name, the Mirage News, a fantasy of news. That's what it was for me. And as the news article here appeared inconsequential or, or fictional as compared to the hectic life in Los Angeles. Going to the library became one of my rituals, like a ceremony. It was a reason to look in the mirror again, to pass a comb through my hair, uh, to change out my, uh, of my worn t-shirts and into a nicer colored shirt. I'm not sure why I maintain this practice. Maybe deep inside, I was still hoping to meet an interesting person there. That was probably why I always felt anxious during the 15 minute walk to the library. Every time I came to the library, there were three or four people, other people there, usually men, sitting there reading or browsing a book or a magazine, just like me. I don't mean the students or researchers who were there to study. I mean people like me who were there to pass the time or to break off their loneliness for a few hours. Over time, I learned to recognize all of them. They were always the same people. Men, approximately my age, quiet, with gazing eyes and an expression of tedium on their faces. I recognized all of them, but I had not talked to any of them. We just sat there quietly with the same purpose under the same umbrella of solitude. But interestingly, their silence, silent presence gave me a sense of companionship. I actually looked forward to seeing them sitting there every time I came to the library. It all changed one day when Mori did not show up. Of course, I still did not know his name at that time, <clears throat> but I remembered him and I noticed that he was not there. For a long time, I had been watching him from the corner of my eye. A good looking man, he seemed to be in his late 60s or maybe early 70s, slim body, blonde hair, bright blue eyes. And I thought that he noticed me too. His eyes seemed to light up every time I stepped into the library. Maury was absent for a day, then a week, then a few weeks. For an unknown reason, I felt worried about him. After a long time together, I believed that we had developed a kind of mental connection without exchanging a single word. Without thinking, I, became visit I began visiting the library more frequently to see if, I had if he had returned. A few times I just stepped in, noticed that he was still not there and immediately left. When he finally returned to the library three months and two days later, yes, I counted every day, he looked a little slimmer and even more subdued than before. I watched him quietly. His eyes were surfing the pages of a glossy publication with curiosity. Was I detecting a new sense of excitement in him, a new wave of energy? I very much wanted to know where he was. What happened to him? Was he okay now? But I hesitated to ask. After all, I had never spoken to him before, but my curiosity was stronger than my fear. Hello, sir, I approached him, interrupting his concentration as he read the magazine, and I noticed that it was a medical magazine. He raised his head, and his bright blue eyes looked at me surprised with a puzzled, do I know you, look on his face, but he turned back to his magazine without saying a word. My name is Leo, I continued. It is short for Leonora. I noticed that you haven't been here for a few weeks. He dropped the magazine and gave me an intense look, almost as if he were going to discipline me for something awful I, just, I had just done. Maury, he said, my name is Maury. Do you like coffee? That was the beginning of a relationship. I want to read you my, the last thing today. All hell break loose on the day of Benji's 16th birthday. I plan to invite three or four of his school friends, Benji is the son of, uh, of Leonora, to a small celebration, bake the chocolate cake that he loved most and try to give him a good time. If the Mish one has any, what's going on? Somebody is talking. Sorry, I took care of it, go ahead. Okay, these friends had never visited our house before and I felt that now that they were all grown ups and mature, this birthday would help to break the ice. Benji did not like the idea. He became upset and gave me a strong no way answer when I told him about my plan. I got mad at him and I went ahead and planned the party anyway. It, became, it came from a good place. I had a strong desire for Benji to feel like a normal kid. At four o'clock when Benji did not show up for his own birthday party, 
I knew something must be terribly wrong. He certainly did not like the idea, I thought, after canceling the party and sending his friends back to their homes. Where is he hiding? I, hur I hurriedly visited all the regular places in the park, under a tall eucalyptus tree, in the back of the schoolyard, where I knew Benji would usually hide, but he was nowhere to be found. Abe, her husband, came back from work around eight in the evening. He saw my face, immediately understood the situation and gave me his usual, this is your fault, look. We sat in the living room feeling dreadful and waited. I found myself looking at the big clock in the room again and again. The minutes ticked away very slowly. I will not repeat to you the thoughts that went through my mind during these long hours. Was it my fault? Was I truly a terrible mother like Abe kept telling me? Could I do a better job? After midnight, we figured that we were waiting for the inevitable. So we were not surprised when early in the morning, the two officers from the Los Angeles police knocked up on our door. We found him, the lady officer said in a grim tone. I'm so sorry. I watched Abe's face. There was no reaction, not even a blink of an eye. I myself felt the wind being knocked out of my lungs. I could not cry, I could not scream, I could not react. He did leave a short note, the officer said, handing me a wrinkled piece of paper. We found it next to his body. My dear Ima, I couldn't take it anymore. Please don't be mad at me. Love you forever, Benji. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Guri. And uh, certainly your book is uh, what I know is very, is very emotive. And I would want each of you to, uh, and it's available on Amazon. So uh, thank you. And we're going to now take a break and go a bit back to Guri for his second song. And Guri will let us know why he chose it and what it, the personal meaning behind this song is. Okay, uh, this is another Yiddish song that I heard from my father that used to sing it to me in Yiddish. <coughs> the song, song is called Reizale. Reizale was written by Mordechai Gebirtik, another very influential Yiddish poet. Uh, music was his life. He wrote the music and the lyrics, uh, but he was actually a carpenter that's how he made a living. Uh, Mordechai Gebirtik died in the ghetto. He was shot uh, by the Nazis. He wrote many, many songs. One of them is another one I used to play on the harmonica. It's called uh, Unser Städtel Brent. Our Städtel is burning. It's a song that they usually play on Yom HaShoah, the Holocaust and Memorial Day. Very, very sad song. But today I want to play to you something that is a little bit uh, easier to play and easier to think about. It's a, it's a love story about a girl and a boy. I'll show you the English translation in a minute, but let me try to read to you a couple of lines in Yiddish. Zeid zich don't in gesele, stil farkacht a heisele, dreinen oifen boidem stibel, voint mein teil reisele, jeden oven farn heisel, Jai ich zicharum, geben a frei und rum ois, reisel, kum, kum, kum. Offen sich, wenn stater, wachen, oin, solter, heisele, und bold klingt in schlägen gessel, as is cool, schweden, reisele, noch a veil waren mein lieber, bald war ich sein frei, grey sich noch a pur mul iber, eins, zwei, drei. Uh, it's about a love song between a boy that walks under a window where his lover Rezele lives and he whistles and the girl tells him don't whistle it's not common for Jewish people to whistle find another way to signal to me when you want me to come out and <clears throat> so that's the one two three okay you can read the lyrics while I play you the song
Thank you so much. Very nice. Now, also, uh, Guri, I want to let you know that Martin is with us, and maybe you want to welcome Martin to the group. Oh, okay. Hi, Martin. Uh, thank you for coming. I told uh, Jeffrey that you will be there, so I'm very glad uh, that you're able to join. And can you let us? Can you let us know who Martin is? And if Martin can get on camera, we'd like. Martin to love is my Spanish teacher. And he's teaching me Spanish. He lives in Mexico. And uh, I, I'm really happy that he was able to join. All right, very good. And I'm so pleased to now transition to uh, Ava Marini, who is my friend from Minneapolis, though we never knew each other from Minneapolis until we came to, until I came to San Diego and started the group. So Eva and I have a long history. Eva was one of the founding participants of programming for our group way back in, the, in May of 2021 or June of 2021 when she presented her book. And I think you're going to find Eva's presentation absolutely amazing and, and her mother's story of survival as a, as a survivor from Auschwitz is nothing short of a miraculous. So um, before I um, give the program over to Eva, I want to let you know that Eva grew up in Czechoslovakia, as my mom did, as an only child of two Holocaust survivor parents. Shortly after graduating from economic school, she escaped from communist regime and emigrated to the United States. She lives in Minneapolis with her husband, uh, close to their three children, and she has six grandchildren, Mazel tov. She enjoys reading, practicing yoga, traveling, cooking, baking, and you're going to hear about that a lot today, spending time with her family and friends. Before the Second World War, Ika, Elena, and Erno, Ernest, each lived in a comfortable life in Czechoslovakia. Their lives were shattered by Nazi cruelty, prejudice, and devastation. Erno spent several years in various Hungarian forced labor units where he was required to perform strenuous manual labor. He has courageously escaped with the help of, righteous, of the righteous people who saved his life. Hidden Recipes is a story of endurance, a will to sur survive, courage, faith, and finding joy and happiness again. And beautiful, and welcome to the program again, Eva, and please, uh, all of us are welcoming you uh, to the mic. Thank you so much uh, for your kind introduction, Jeffrey, and thank you for inviting me to speak here today. Um, hello, everyone. I'm honored to be here with all of you and share with you the story of my parents. As, as uh, Jeffrey mentioned, I'm a, I was born in Czechoslovakia as an only child to two Holocaust survivor parents. I grew up without grandparents and only knew them through the stories that my parents told me. I knew that I was different because my friends had grandparents and they had a large family and I did not. I began to ask my parents questions at a young age and my parents gave me simple answers when I was young so as not to scare me, but my questions were always answered truthfully and age appropriately. And I will start sharing with you my presentation. Um, Initially, the story of my parents was intended to be a family history book for my children and grandchildren only. But today there is such a shocking rise in hatred and antisemitism and Holocaust denial and distortion of history are frequent occurrences. As a second generation of Holocaust survivors, I felt that this is not only my responsibility, but it's my obligation to go public with the story of my parents in hope to educate the younger generation who knows very little about the Holocaust. Hidden Recipes is the story of my parents, Elena and Ernest, but in the book I refer to them as Itza and Erno, as this is how they were called by family and friends. My parents didn't know each other um, before the war. Both of them were born in Austria-Hungary. 
Um, my father was already married before the war. He had a wife and they had a little girl who was born during the, like maybe 1940, uh, daughter Marika. The Austro-Hungarian Empire collapsed at the end of World War I and the first Czechoslovak Republic was founded in 1918. Life in Czechoslovakia was very good for everybody. The first president, Tomáš Garik Masaryk, respected all the rights of the citizens and the government protected the Jews from antisemitism. My mother, Itza, had a happy childhood and they had a comfortable life. Her father, my Kellner grandfather, owned a textile business. Itza's parents hired a German governess. They wanted her to learn German as they spoke German, Hungarian, and later Czechoslovak. And this may have saved her life later. She was an only child until age 15 when her sister Vera was born. Family and friends called her Babi. And you can see the big age difference between Itza and Babi. When Itza was older, her parents sent her to a prestigious German school in Brno, Brunn, currently in Czech Republic. And she spoke fluently German. And when she completed uh, the school and returned back home, she became a kindergarten teacher. Unfortunately, the peaceful and prosperous life in Czechoslovakia did not last long. Czechoslovakia became Hitler's target for annexations. And end of September 1938, the Munich conference, during the Munich conference, the northern, and I try to, northern, western, and part of the southern region, this was the Sudetenland, was, was ceded to Germany. And approximately one month later, uh, the southern part, that was the first Vienna award, the southern part of Czechoslovakia, currently Slovakia, this is the green, green color, the region where both my mother's and my father's families lived, this was forced to cede to Hungary. So with the annexation of the southern region of Czechoslovakia, my parents were no longer Czechoslovak citizens. They became Hungarian citizens. The partition of Czechoslovakia determined the fate of the Jews. Those who lived in the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia and the Jews of Slovakia, they were deported early in early 1940s. The Hungarian Jews, including my family, were the last one to be deported. And I don't know if I mentioned, but the Sudetenland had a uh, German, German uh, Bohemian uh, Czech population, and that was ceded to Germany. So anyway, now that they were Hungarian, my family, my father Erno, together with all the Hungarian men who were capable of work, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> who were capable of work, they were required to serve in the mandatory Hungarian forced labor service. They served unarmed because according to the Hungarians, they were unreliable to carry arms. The Jews were unreliable to carry arms. And they did strenuous work. I'm going to stop sharing for a, for a little bit and we'll come back later. So they did strenuous work, dig, digging trenches, uh, building railroads and, and uh, bridges and uh, even taking out heavy stones from the rivers. And they were guarded by the brutal Nilash, uh, the anti-Semitic fascist uh, Hungarian Aerocross troops. Erno, my father, survived just because 
he escaped with the help of a righteous Gentile. One day, uh, his unit was taking a rest period and a complete stranger walked up to Erne, my father, and he said to him quietly, why don't you run away? That evening, and he said to him, up on the mountain, there is a stable with horses. You could hide there. And that evening, when everybody went to sleep, during the, the night, my father went up to the mountain, found the, the place with the stable with the horses. And he wasn't, he was told he cannot hide there, but go to the next stable and you can hide over there. So he found the next stable up on the mountain. And to his surprise, there were a few other Jewish people hiding. The people who owned the stable together with another family not far living also had a house up on the mountain. Uh, they would bring food every day. These people were, each and every one was an upstander, not a bystander. So even one person could make a difference. Hungary was allied with Germany during World War II. And in June of 1941, all the Axis powers invaded Soviet Union. And Germany was defeated because the, the battles near Stalingrad were fierce. And Hungary had substantial losses. And they decided in secret to get out from the alliance with Germany, but Hitler found out this was not acceptable by Hitler. And the German troops invaded Hungary, March 19, 1944. Adolf Eichmann arrived to Budapest just shortly after the invasion because he was in charge of deporting the Hungarian Jews, the last remaining uh, Jewish population in Central Europe. And even Eichmann was surprised to see how enthusiastically the Hungarians collaborated with him. My mother Itza was 31 years old. She was still single when the deportation of Hungarian Jews started spring of 44. Her sister, Babi, was only 16 years old. Together with their parents and all the rest of the Jewish people, they were forced to move out immediately from their home, leave most of their possessions behind and moved into a ghetto, which was sectioned, they sectioned off a few houses in this uh, town, Pleshivets, and they brought Jewish people from all the surrounding areas, also from the town of Yelshava, where my father's family was. So his, his uh, parents and his wife, his daughter, and other family members. And the conditions were very, very crowded in because a section of homes, like in one family home, they would put three, four families together. So it was crowded and they couldn't leave the premises anymore. And Itza, my mother Itza noticed a little girl with blonde curly hair and blue eyes. She was playing in the courtyard of the ghetto and she was singing and reciting poems. And Itza being a kindergarten teacher who loved children, she stopped to talk to the little girl and met the girl's mother. It, they happened to be my father's wife and daughter. And as I mentioned, my mother and father didn't know each other. A friendship developed between the two women. They met a few times. And after a few weeks, the ghetto was liquidated. Everyone was herded into cattle trains and Itza never saw Erno's wife, Irenke, and daughter, Marika, again. The cattle trains were crowded and the journey took about three days. They were not given they were not given food or water and they, they were so, it was so crowded that they were just standing 
They couldn't even sit, they couldn't even sleep and they couldn't move. And it was hot and stuffy in the train because there were no windows. They were dehydrated, they were weak from starving, from hunger. And by the time they arrived to their destination, there were many dead among them. Finally, the train came to a stop and the doors were thrown open and the daylight was blinding, um, being locked in the dark for three days. Itza never forgot her first impression when she stepped off the train. It was an eerie feeling to see a vast area. There was no grass, no trees. There was heavy smoke coming out of the chimneys and there was a terrible stench in the air. They arrived at Auschwitz, also known as Auschwitz II or Birkenau, the largest of the Nazi concentration and death camps in Poland. They never heard of Auschwitz before. For some, Birkenau Killing Center was their final destination. This was the middle of June, 1944, and there were barbed, electric barbed wires, and on the tra train, the train uh, ramp, there were Nazis with vicious dogs barking. And immediately the men were taken away. And my grandfather couldn't even say goodbye to his family. As he was taken away, he just looked back with very sad eyes. That was the way he said goodbye. The women were ordered to form a line. And when they approached the notorious SS physician, Josef Mengele, who was nicknamed the angel of death, Itza's mother was sent to the left. He pointed for her to go to the left and Itza and Babi to the right. The two sisters never saw their parents again. Later that day, Itza stopped a Polish prisoner in a striped uniform. Please tell us, where did they take our parents? And he pointed to the smoke, to the chimney, smoking chimneys, and he said, do you see that smoke up there? That is where your parents are. And this is how they found out that their parents were already dead and that the terrible stench in the air was the smell of the burning flesh. The mass deportation of nearly 430,000 Hungarian Jews to Auschwitz took place between May 15 and July 9, 1944, just approximately seven weeks. 90% of the Hungarian Jews who arrived to Auschwitz were exterminated. And I'm going to share with you my screen one more time. 90% were exterminated and among them, this is my father's little daughter, Marika. Here she was a baby. We only have two pictures left. So this is one picture of Marika and I will show you that this is the second picture. So my, my, mod, my mother is with the shawl in the front. That's my mother and her parents are sitting in the front and my mother's sister, Bobby. So my grandparents went straight to the gas chambers. These are my paternal grandparents, my father's parents. They weren't, they were murdered. My uncle Shani or Alex, he was in a forced labor unit just like my father was. Uh, meanwhile, his wife Elsa and two little children, a baby and a little boy, Tommy and Robbie were gassed, as was Marika here. She was a little older, but by the time she was murdered, she was three years old. My aunt, my father's sister, Clary, sent her children to my Kaufman grandparents from Slovakia to Hungary, feeling, believing that in Hungary they will be safer. My aunt and uncle survived hiding with the partisans in the mountains, Adi, Virka, and Adi. 
they were gassed together with the grandparents. And this is my father's youngest brother who Dunzi or Edmund, who was sent to the Russian front. And this young Hungarian men were, asked, were told to clear the minefields with their bare hands while the war, while the battle was raging. Over 40,000 young Jewish men perished there, among them my father's youngest brother, Dunzi. He was only 22 years old. And uh, my father never found out how his brother died. Um, was, was he cruelly treated by the Hungarians who were in charge or did he starve? Did he freeze? Or was he overcome by disease or blown up while picking the minefields? He never knew. And uh, I may, well, I will not stop it. I'll leave the sharing on. So meanwhile, my mother and her sister, my aunt, were spared, at least temporarily. They were ordered to strip naked, sent to the showers. This time was a real shower, just barely wet their bodies. And then they were sprayed with disinfectant, which burned. And their hair was shaved off everywhere on their body. And then they were given one ragged, piece of clothes, no undergarments, nothing. Itza also got a pair of wooden clocks. Not everybody had shoes. And in Auschwitz, I don't have to tell you, I'm sure you all know that there was hunger, death, diseases, and brutality all around them. These Hungarian women were no longer registered. The registration system collapsed in Auschwitz due to the overload with the arrival of the Hungarian Jews. So they were kept as temporary work, but Itza and Babi did not get assigned any work. Their, most of their days were taken up by cell appel, roll calls, during which they were counted. And if even one number was off, they would be recounted, thousands of women. And it was a form of punishment. Um, they would get them up, wake them up at 4, 4.30 in the morning and, and rush them out to stand at Tselapel. And they were tired, cold, hungry, and, and they would often support one another. And then again, they, they stood at hours at Tselapel during the day the noon time when the sun was so hot and these women were, they were bald, they didn't have hair. And many of these women got sunstroke. And those who collapsed, they were taken away and never seen again. Food was scarce in Auschwitz, people were hard, starving. And rations were intentionally very small, they, it barely kept them alive. They got, in the morning, they got brown water, which they called coffee. Um, at noon, they had a little bowl of soup, which uh, my Itza said that there was weed inside. There were weeds inside or grass. And if somebody found a potato peel, was very lucky on that day. And in the evening, they got a small piece of bread. And my mother always showed it on her on the palm of her hand, she said, a small piece of bread like this, and I always divided it into three pieces, just in case I need some later, or her little sister in case needed. So when they were back in the barracks in the evenings, they would huddle together, these women, and talk about food. The hunger and malnutrition was a huge threat to their life. And imagination was a very important tool and they remembered the meals and in their mind, they substitute, substituted real food for memory of food. Meanwhile, selections were going on constantly and they didn't know from one minute to the next when it is their turn. And the day arrived when Itza and Bobby were among the women selected to go to the gas chambers. They stood there all day, 
and they stood there all night. And that day, the Nazis ran out of Cyclone B. In the morning, in the morning, uh, now it was August 1944, an order came from Germany requesting Jewish slave laborers. 1,000 Hungarian women, among them Itza and Babi, together with the women who were standing in front of the gas chambers, all together 1,000 Hungarian women were put on cattle trains and transported to Germany, to the Hesse, Hesse region near Kassel. They were taken to an underground munition factory in Hesse Schlichtenau. This is what they thought. They all thought they were in an underground munition factory. But later I found out, and I will share it with you, it was not really underground. Hesse Schlichtenau Munition Factory was a subcamp of Buchenwald concentration camp, one of the largest munition factories, not only in Germany, but in, in, in the entire Europe. And when these emaciated women arrived in Hesse Schlichtenau, a suburb of Hirschhagen in Germany, the commandant of the camp was shocked to see the condition they were in. They, by this time, they were skin and bone. And he turned to the SS guards and he said, I asked for workers. You brought me skeletons. But this was now summer 1944 and Germany had labor shortage. So they accepted them. And this is where they were registered for the very first time. And they got a, a piece of cotton rag was hand stamped with a number and Itza became prisoner number 20409 and Bobby prisoner 20407. On the left side, you see the circle pin and it says Fabrik Hesse Schlichtenau, shortened. Uh, this was given only to my mother and I will explain to you later why. And on the right side, I mentioned to you that my mother got a pair of wooden clocks in Auschwitz. Um, she thought that perhaps this tie that was on the wooden clocks could have been cut from a mezuzah and she saved it. The work was physically demanding for these malnourished women, filling grenades, mines, mines and bombs with toxic materials was very dangerous to inhale. And, and it's a said, my mother often said, the, many of the women, their skin turned yellow. They were yellow. Uh, so many of them got liver poisoning because of, from the inhalation of these toxic materials. And as you know, the Germans were very good at keeping records. So my mother, Itza, who was Ilona, born Ilona Kellner, 20409 on the right top corner, and all the other, they, they kept amazing records. Um, this one is a table from a book. On the bottom, you can see a source, Dieter Waupel, from a book that he wrote in the early, in 1984, in the, in the 80s. He was a German, not Jewish, a German teacher, high school teacher in Hesse Schlichtenau, who had a feeling that something happened during the war but nobody, the residents wouldn't talk. And when he asked questions, they would get upset and they would say, leave the past alone. But he did not. And he, he found out what about this munition factory with the slave laborers. And he did a research on, this one, on the transport of the 1,000 Hungarian women from Auschwitz to Hesse Schlichtenau, among them Itza and Babi. And as you can see on the top of the table, it says arrival in Hesse Schlichtenau, arrival and departure. And the very first line 
August 2nd, 1944, 1,000, oh, sorry, 1,000 women from Auschwitz. It says 1,000 prisoners. And the next day, two days later, uh, August 4, Eva Fischer, uh, she died of suffocation. She was a friend from Pleshivets, the town where my mother was from and my aunt. She suffocated two days later, a good friend of my family. And now the number went down to 999. If you look the one before the last line, October 27, 206 departure, 206 women were sent back to Auschwitz and the number total number goes down to 792. 206 women were sent back because they couldn't keep up with work. Some of them got sick. The work was so strenuous they couldn't keep up. And they went back to Auschwitz straight to the gas chambers. Uh, Bobby, my aunt, uh, who was only 16 years old, her assignment was to load heavy explosives onto a wheelbarrow. So with another prisoner had to put the explosive onto a wheelbarrow from a table, take it to another place, unload it. And this was very difficult for a petite 16 year old who, who was skin and bone. And she often pleaded with her sister, with my mother Itza, Itza, leave me alone already. I can't bear it anymore. Just let me die. But of course, it's a, this is what kept her going to make sure that her sister will be okay. Itza was fluent in German and she spoke with a Hochdeutsch, high German dialect, and was selected by the Nazis to be a translator and a messenger. And she was told, if there is no translation and no messages, then I, we want you to clean the munition factory. And this is why she had the round circle pin. This is why she had this identification pin, because she had to take mess messages throughout the entire vast premises of the factory. And she always thought, that the munition factory was underground, just like everybody else. Dieter Waupel just recently published a book. Um, oh, and I have it written down, um, the name of the book, uh, A Fairy Tale Unmasked. He published together with uh, author and journalist Dizzy Stone, Dana Stone, uh, in the fairy tale Unmasked, where he writes about his research on this 1,000 Hungarian women, and it turns out it was just the factory was just very well camouflaged with bushes and trees planted on on the roof of the factory. Now. In Hessisch Lichtenau, they continued to get small rations. They were starving. There was hunger and starvation, suffering, diseases, bitter cold and death all around them. And when they were back in the barracks, they would often talk about food. That was really the most uh, frequent topic, the food. And they would share recipes with each other. Um, what the foods that they ate at home for holidays and Shabbat with their families. The memory of pre-war life was a powerful survival tool and talking about food was essential because it gave them hope. So after the long shifts, they had to walk one and a half hour back to the barracks from the factory. And every evening they talked about food. And Itza wanted so much to write down these recipes. And one day when she was cleaning the factory, she saw a big stack of paper thrown into the garbage, into the, into, into the wastebasket. And when nobody saw, she pilfered a stack of paper. She also found a very small little pencil. 
And she always said that the one piece of uh, ragged clothing that she got was like a summer coat, a uh, very light fabric, but kind of big. And she was petite, only five feet tall. She quickly tore the bottom, the seams of that piece of clothing and made it into a fabric pouch and hid the paper, those papers that she pilfered, hid into the pouch and she put it on the inside of her, of that one piece of garment. And these were German papers that carried the information about munition that was manufactured in Hessisch-Lichtenau, the bombs, the grenades, the mines, and was used to annihilate the Jews during the Holocaust. And it was thrown away with, without being used. And on the other side, it was blank. So it was suitable for writing, but she had to be very careful not to be discovered or she would be shot. Writing was a form of indirect, indirect resistance on her part. This was her way to defy the Nazis. There was so much that they took away from them, but this was one thing they couldn't. So she began to write. And I want to share with you a few, few of the recipes. This is a five centimeter, uh, light grenade launcher. It has 33 pieces in it. Probably was going to be uh, glued to a package that was sent out. And Itza wrote mandula pudding, which is uh, almond pudding. And the name, the person who gave it to her, Pani. Here, in the, here it says Pani, gave her the recipe. Now, if you recall on that table, I showed you that 206 women were sent back because they couldn't keep up with work and they were sent to the gas chamber of Auschwitz. Among them was Pani, was one of the women sent back to Auschwitz. The next one is Regal Mine, 43. And she wrote Krebesh Toltelik, which, which is a uh, feeling for the wonderful Hungarian pastry Napoleons. And on the very bottom under Regal Mine 43, you can see Dr. Gershne, which means Mrs. Gersh, wife of Dr. Gersh, gave her this recipe. The next one is SD50. SD50 was a high explosive uh, bomb, fragmentation bomb that was used by Luftwaffe during World War II. And it's a road, Darash Fesek, which the exact translation is like wasp nest because the dough is put next to each other. It's a yeast dough, like a wasp nest. This was given to her by Piri. And Piri survived Auschwitz. She survived Hessisch Lichtenau. She was shot during the death march. And I'll tell you that story in a little bit. This one is, you can see Hessisch Lichtenau. Uh, this was like an entry to ticket. So the high Nazi officials, if they came to the premises of the munition factory, they had to fill out this form, uh, date and, uh, name and and uh, sign it and it's a road the recipe for gestenje rollat gestenje rollat which means chestnut rollate given to her by irene uh, the other recipe that i want to show you is sc250 which was also it was an airdropped general purpose high explosive bomb also used by Luftwaffe during World War II. This bomb weighs 250 kilogram, 550 pounds. And it's I wrote the, on the other side, she wrote the fig and nut slices given to her by Mariska. SC50 was a, also a general purpose bomb uh, used by Luftwaffe and she, this was somebody else's handwriting, um, Magdolna cookies. Uh, this lady always wanted to 
write the recipes. She didn't want my mother to write it. She wanted to write it for my mother. So this was this lady's handwriting and she wrote her name on the bottom. Uh, Dr. Jamborny Etel, Zala Egersek. So her name was Etel Jambor, wife of Dr. Jambor from Zala Egersek in Hungary. And the last one that I want to share with you is it was a delivery entrance ticket uh, that has the recipe again by Mariska, Turos Gombos, which is a uh, sweet farmer cheese dumplings. So I'm going to stop sharing for a little bit and we'll come back again to this. So as I said, this was an indirect resistance on it, its as part. And uh, writing, talking about food and writing down the recipes, it gave her hope and helped her to maintain her sense of dignity. And she wrote hundreds of recipes, hundreds of them, all in Hungarian. And many of the recipes have the name of the people who gave her the recipe. Now, it was already spring of 1945, and the Allied troops were approaching, and they could hear gunfire from nearby. So Hitler ordered to gas all the remaining Jews. And the Nazis decided to evacuate Hessisch Lichtenau and take them to Theresienstadt, Theresien uh, in Czech Republic. Apparently there was one remaining gas chamber that was functioning, one gas chamber. Uh, and I meant to verify this, but this is what my mother told me. Hessisch Lichtenau, the subcamp sub of Buchenwald was evacuated in end of March, 1945. They were put on trains and again, cattle trains and the train kept making stops. The allies were getting closer and closer and, and already a few days, two, three, four days, they were on the train and they couldn't, they could not continue due to frequent bombings. And they finally got off with the women, got off the train and in, in Leipzig. And I would like to read just a very short excerpt. In Leipzig, they stayed overnight in a vacant Hitler Jugend, Hitler Youth building. The Allies did not know that the building had been evacuated by the Nazis and was instead being occupied by women. And consequently, the Allies started to bomb it during the night. As the Allies shot phosphorus and dropped magnesium flare bombs to illuminate the building, and started to fly lower with their airplanes, they were surprised to see women running out of the building. Immediately, immediately they stopped the bombing, but part of the building was already in flames. A few women died, but the majority of them escaped by running out of the building in the middle of the night. Itza ran outside with the others, but then realized she had forgotten the pouch with the recipes inside the building. My recipes, I forgot my recipes. She turned around and ran back to rescue her precious recipe collection. Her sister and others cried out to her, Itza, what are you doing? Don't go back inside. But she did not listen, exclaiming to them, I have to get my recipes and she ran back into the burning building. So the Nazis from Leipzig took them, decided to walk with them toward the Czech border. First they walked during the night, uh, during the day and rested during the night. Then because the allies were getting closer, they were hiding in the woods during the day and walked at night. And those who could not keep up, they were immediately shot. Food was scarce. There were 
no, lo no longer daily rations. So they stopped occasionally on farms to ask the farmer for some food. And in one of these farms, the farmer agreed to boil potatoes. So while he was boiling this big pot of potatoes, Piri, who I mentioned, who was the recipe of a wasp nest, Piri could no longer wait. She ran up, grabbed a hot boiling potato from the pot. Immediately she was shot and she died by the feet of the women, uh, just days before being liberated. Uh, the Nazis began to fear for their own lives and started, little by little, started to abandon the transport. And one day, the women found themselves all alone with, without SS guards. And on this day, the death march that began two weeks before came to an end in Wurzen, about 26 kilometers from Leipzig. So the women formed little groups and Itza and Bobby were in a group of about approximately 12 women and they began to walk in Germany toward, toward their home country. And suddenly they saw an American Jeep approaching Risa or Dahlen in Germany, she couldn't remember. The women were overjoyed to see the Jeep. Four, the Jeep came to a stop and four American soldiers stepped out and they took them back from the Risa or Dahlen, back to Wurzen, where they were liberated April 25, 1945. Some of the women who shared the recipes with my mother did not survive. Those who did are no longer alive, but their stories and the recipes will live on for many generations to come. And I'm going to go back to share a little bit more with you. Um, and just to tell you, the recipes uh, were donated to the United States Holocaust Museum in 2017. I personally delivered them. It was a very difficult decision to make. This is my aunt Babi, my mother's younger sister, one day when she came from Czechoslovakia to visit us in the United States. And the two sisters were so fortunate to, to be together throughout their entire captivity. And this is my mother and me. Uh, she was baking all these torts and little cookies, all the pastry she loved to bake. And we were just looking, oh, this was one, one of the, my son's bar mitzvah. And in the book, Hidden Recipes, I decided to translate some of the six recipes. Um, and on top, this is the Linzer cookies, which was my favorite for my birthday. My mom had to make it always. To the right is the Ischler, Ischler cookies. Uh, this one is an almond tort. And on the bottom, six o'clock, is the famous gerbo salad. Gerbo is a very well known pastry shop in Budapest until today. This is one of their signature cakes. And next, that's the one with the chocolate top. And next to it is the, oh, sorry, next to it is the sour cherry. Uh, cookies or cake or pastry. And Piri, who was shot, uh, this is the wasp nest. This is why it's called the wasp nest. And then the end result is, sorry, the end result is the wonderful piece of yeast. It's a yeast dough with walnuts, sugar, um, cinnamon. And as I mentioned to you, I am an only child. And oh, the, first of all, this is my mom at age 90. We celebrated her 90th birthday a few years ago. My parents are no longer alive. Uh, this is my family today from an only child. And we are blessed with six wonderful grandchildren. 
And since they were little, we always bake together hala, homantash, and the sour cherry cake, all kinds of things. And as you all know, 6 million European Jews were murdered in the Holocaust by Nazi Germany and their collaborators. Jews were the primary victims of the Holocaust, but there were many other victims. The horrors of the Holocaust were the result of hatred. And we all must learn from it and must always remember and tell these stories kindness and compassion must win over hatred. And as Elie Wiesel said, to remain silent and indifferent is the greatest sin of all. And in the book, um, in the book I also write about, um, about injustice after the Holocaust and how my parents met after the war and life behind the Iron Curtain and the immigration from Czechoslovakia to United States. And uh, I would like to end it with one more reading. Um, the theme of today's event is love stories from the hol horrors of the Holocaust. So I would like to read for you a just a short chapter about my parents. My mother was a strong lady who got through many challenges in life. She was courageous, self-assured, and very capable. She knew what she wanted in life and always remained true to herself, living with integrity, honesty, and the values that were important to her. She was lively and animated, had a cheerful disposition, and was pleasant and fun to be around. She loved life and people. She was kind and friendly with people from all walks of life. My father was a very kind, sensitive, and gentle person. He was pleasant, always with a smile on his face. He was very patient and polite and was a real old school gentleman. I remember my father often kissing my mother's hand as a gesture of respect, admiration, and devotion. He never raised his voice, not with my mother and not with me. I saw the affection between the two of them and their devotion to each other. Wherever they went, they always held hands. They loved people and were also loved by many. It was much later when they were older and I realized how many, that I realized how many lives had been touched over the years by their kindness. And I'm going to stop sharing. Um, by their kindness. My mother was 62 years old and my parents had lived in the United States for three years when she announced to my husband and me that she had decided to get her driver's license. Neither of my parents had driven in Europe. This was to be her first time driving a car and at that age. We were worried and assured them that we were happy to continue driving them to do grocery shopping and go anywhere else. My mother thanked us. But no, her mind was made up. She received her driver's license and they brought a new car. She was a very good driver and drove the same car for over 20 years until the car was no longer drivable. When my parents did not have a car any longer, my husband, our oldest son, or sometimes I, always managed to take them wherever they needed to go. People truly liked them, and everywhere they went, they were greeted with much warmth. If it was the lady behind the cash register in one of the upscale grocery stores, or the nurses and the doctors during their medical appointments, or the men in the car repair shop where they were loyal customers, they were treated exceptionally well. These were heartwarming experiences for me to see. 
So many people knew my parents by name and liked this older couple who were constant companions everywhere they went. My mother loved to cook and even more, she loved to bake. Although she did not eat many pastries, she liked seeing the pleasure on the faces of others who enjoyed the pastries she made. Everything was made from scratch and everything was super. She could bake all kinds of Hungarian pastries, torts, cookies, and yeast cakes. My parents had a loving, happy marriage for almost 60 years. They were inseparable. They were the role models for many of us. To me, my husband, Jack, our three children, Tommy, Mark, and Corinne, and many of our friends. They were two remarkable people who in spite of hardships and suffering, lived a happy life together. My parents were an integral, integral part of our lives. They were overjoyed and felt blessed becoming grandparents. And they developed a very special bond and closeness with their three grandchildren. Their unconditional and unwavering love for their family and the love that they received in return from us gave them a strong will to live. They lived a full life and we were blessed to have them in our lives until they reached their late 90s. Thank you. Wow. Well, I'll take this program back, but if anybody was next to me, you'd see me crying because um, my mother was an Auschwitz survivor. Along with her two sisters, my mother arrived in April of 1944 from Kosice, Czechoslovakia. And Ava and I have talked many times whether the possibility of my mom and her mom knew each other in Auschwitz and her story and her mother obviously has told Ava so much about her camp life. The opposite was true for me. My mother would never speak. And so I've learned a lot from Ava about my mom's journey. And I just love when Ava comes and I hope you appreciate Ava's story and I hope you um, ask and it's on Amazon, read Ava's book. It's, it's a beautiful testament to um, Ava's mother and father and mostly her mother. But before I let you go, Ava, and before we go to q and I have a couple of questions for you. Those of you who are looking at and, and hopefully are on screen and can see the menorah that's towards the back near the wall, I'd love for you to talk about that menorah, but I also want you to, if you're willing to, share the story of the Torah, which sits behind the menorah that's on your wall. Uh, I'm going to unplug my, just one second. Um, the menorah is just, I, there is really no, no story. Um, it's, we have a few menorahs in the house, but can you see, I'm not sure if you yeah, can see. Just hold the camera still and now. Can now, you see the Torah? Yeah, yeah, we okay. can. And you can go back and now that everyone's seen it, you can go back and sit okay. down and tell us what your story, tell this amazing story about your. Okay. And there's also a shofar there, I see it. And there is a shofar that was made by my son, our son when he was a teenager, yes. Wow. Um, so the story about the Torah is when the Jews of the, the town where my mother and my grandparents and my aunt lived in Slovakia, it's called Pleshivac, about 40 kilometers from Kosice. And later, only after the war, later on, we moved to Kosice. But anyway, so the, when the Jewish Jews were taken away, deported, 
the synagogue in Plashivas was ransacked. Everything was thrown out on the streets and damaged. And when my mother and my aunt returned back home, an older lady, a Christian religious old lady came with a bundle in her arms, carrying a bundle, came to my mother and said, she told her that everything was thrown out of the, uh, everything was on the street, broken and damaged from the synagogue. And she said to my mother, I know that this is something that is sacred to the Jews. And when nobody saw me, I picked it up and hid it. And now that you are back, I want to give it to you. And she gave it to my mother and my mother was so touched. It was a Torah roll scroll. I mean, so let, let me explain. So my mother just looked at it and it was a Torah from the synagogue. And she was so touched that she already by this time, she already had opened up a textile store like my grandfather did after the war just to make ends meet. She gave a few meters of fabric to the lady and she thanked her. And she said, and where did you hide it? And the lady said to her, I hid it in the pig style under the straw because I was hoping that the Nazis will, that, that nobody will discover it. Nobody will, will find it there. So my mother, you know, my mother and my aunt were the only two sisters who remained for a few years living in that town. There was no more synagogue, but this was so precious for her to have this Torah scroll. And the Torah scroll traveled from Czechoslovakia to United States in 1971. Also the recipes traveled. And when my parents, one day my father said, you know, you should have this in your, we want you to keep it. So when my parents gave it to us, we invited somebody over to look at it and we and my mother wrapped it up in a white damask tablecloth and this is how it was always in the closet and when we invited this friend who is very knowledgeable uh, we opened up the dining table large and opened it torah and to our big surprise there were six large fragments i mean large long you could you could see it was rolled up on both ends and we decided we don't want to keep it in the closet. And we framed each one each, for each of our children with the story below. We gave them a framed Torah portion. And in some of the cases we were able to open up where our child Parsha was. So we have one, and then when we traveled to Czechoslovakia, we took one to my aunt Bobby's only child, my cousin, and he has one also. And then we donated the last piece to our synagogue, also framed with the story. That silence, it's, it's an amazing story, and I, I am so glad that you were willing to share it with our audience. And obviously this is recorded and your story will live on forever. Thank you. And may I just, may, do I have your permission to just say hello and thank you to somebody very special? Please, please. Uh, Michael Rosenblum, who I connected with, who reached out to me when he heard about the recipes that my mother wrote, because Michael's grandma, was also in Auschwitz and in Hesse Schlichtenau. She was very young, just like my aunt. She survived Auschwitz and survived Hesse Schlichtenau. And Michael wanted to know, are there any recipes that my mother got from his grandma? Because his grandma was a very good cook and baked very good pastries.
pastries. Unfortunately, I couldn't find her name, although I found a few recipes where my mother wrote et kishlein, which means a young girl. But there were quite a few young girls. And I got a beautiful message from Michael. Thank you, Michael. A beautiful message from Michael about the presentation today and about his grandma, Frida. So I just wanted to say thank you for being here, Michael. And, and I don't know if there are other people here who I invited, but I'm just so touched having Michael. This is very special to me. Well, Michael, you're- oh, Thank uh, you, thank you so much. Michael, I, I, yes, I, please yeah. take, I'm glad you unmuted. So please, if you have something to tell Ava, go ahead. Michael. Yeah, you, I just want okay. to thank you. Can, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah, I'm just saying thank you so much, Eva. It was fascinating. Um, my mom was on, is on the call from Israel right now. Um, actually, um, hello? Yes, keep, yes, you're freezing up a little bit, so keep talking. Okay. Um, so my mom is here, and actually, uh, um, I, I discovered the story of my grandmother uh, just you know a few years ago after she passed away. I just discovered all this story about Hesse and Lichtenstein uh, through the documentation they left with Bader Olsen, and it's all amazing because when I'm hearing Eva, I'm hearing you know what's happened to my uh, uh, grandmother, and it's kind of one of the source of truth to what happened there because even my mom here and she didn't tell her anything. Uh, about about what happened there, and it's uh, we are really glad and uh, fortunate to uh, meet you, and, and thank you for passing on this uh, story for the next generations, and thank you for your mentioning me. And I want to thank you, Michael, so much. I also want to say uh, and ask you. My other question was, how many recipes did you donate to the U.S. Holocaust Museum? We donated. All the recipes over, we donated over 600 recipes. Now I have to be honest because that's me. Uh, it was very difficult to part with it and talk to my husband and our children. And when finally I made the decision because the recipes were sitting in our closet, you know? So we knew that that is the right choice. When we made a decision to donate, each of my children, they adored my parents. They wanted to have just a recipe from grandma, written by grandma. So each one kept one recipe uh, from grandma, but over 600 were donated. Tell us about the story on how you went from Minneapolis to Washington. So let me start at First of all, I was presenting for, for a group about artifacts. So these recipes were really, these, these papers fitted into a gallon freezer bag. So I took all these over 600 recipes. I didn't know at that time yet uh, how many, but I took them in a gallon of plastic bag to this presentation. And after that, somebody came up to me and was very touched and said, and Eva, where do you keep these recipes? And I said, same as my mom, I keep it in the closet. And sh she said, you know, this is, people should see it. And I said, you are right. And I wasn't sure, do I donate to Yad Vashem? Do I donate to Holocaust Museum, Washington, DC? And I decided our grandchildren could make it easier one day. They are still young. They could make it easier to DC. And I decided to donate to Washington DC. But when I talked to the curator back and forth, back and forth, and then she said to me, and finally I said, okay, I made a decision to donate. And she said to me, I'm going to send you a self-addressed, no postage, whatever envelope, and I said, oh, no, 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 I can't. I can't put it in the mail. I can't do that. And I said, I will come. Can I'm coming. I actually had a trip planned anyway. I'm coming next week. 
can somebody meet me? And somebody met me. I was visiting this friend who was not well. And that's how I, I wasn't going to put it in the mail. When I hung up the phone with the curator, and because I made the decision to give the recipes away, by this time, my parents were no longer alive. I cried so much. It was such a difficult, difficult decision because it was with my mother throughout the Holocaust in Czechoslovakia. It came to United States. It was so precious to her. And I grew up seeing those recipes. She would take them out every Sunday. Every Sunday she baked from these recipes and she would take them out. And, and so it was part of my whole life. But I know this was the right decision to do. And so um, to, con to continue on the story, my mother uh, made something like 250 different dishes and she never had ever used a recipe. And I couldn't figure out how my mother could cook without a recipe. It's impossible. And only when I met Ava and Ava described her story, did I realize that the memory of my mom's recipes probably came from Auschwitz. And it was the first sort of puzzle piece on a journey of many puzzle pieces to figure out how my mom baked so many recipes. And now for those of you who know me and follow me, I, I, I have recreated 50 of my mother's recipes from scratch. I publish a, a weekly um, newsletter called In Mama's Kitchen 2.0. And my friend Peter gave me that new title who's on the, who's on the uh, group today. Um, and I have now give my mom's recipes to all of those who are in our group who love European Hungarian recipes. And because of Ava and my hard work, we are replicating these recipes. And I, you wouldn't believe how many letters and notes I get thanking me for hidden recipes that their bubbies or their mothers made, but they never could figure out how the recipe, they never would left the recipes. And it is such a joy for me to be able to reproduce those recipes. And so with that, I also want to finalize is that I close my eyes every time I hear Ava and I hear my mom. She sounds exactly as I remember my mom growing up. So with that note, I'm going to open it up to everyone, if there's any questions that you want to ask either um, Guri or Ava, please um, hit the reactions button so I can see your question. Um, and I'm going to change the view here. So we're on um, gallery. So is there any questions for Ava or Guri? Jeffrey, before we start, can I just ask you, there are I see a few Please. just beautiful comments and I am having a hard time scrolling through them. Can you please save them? Yeah, save the, these beautiful... the comments will be sent to you, no worries. Okay, please. And thank you to and everyone same, for those and beautiful the same, comments. And the same for Guri. So is there any questions that anybody um, wants to ask? Who wants to be the first? We, uh, come on, we have to have some questions here. Mark, I'm calling you out. You have to unmute, please. The, uh, I'm just so emotionally moved by everything that, you know, that was said today. Um, my childhood, as I said last month, was totally different. My parents never really spoke about it. And Eva, I'm just so amazed at how much you know about your parents' past and everything. I mean... That's just incredible. Did they talk to you about it all the time? Or was this something that they did once for an interview? Did they speak to the Spielberg Foundation? You know, the Shoah Foundation? How did you get all this information? I envy you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you for your question and comment. My parents were one of those people who did talk always about what they went through, about their experiences. 
when when I was little, I would play in the background and I would hear my parents, their friends were Holocaust survivors. And I would hear my parents talk with their friends and I would see tears in their eyes and I would sadness and I would listen. I would listen. Um, and so I was exposed to it since a young age and I would ask questions. And, but I have to tell you, my childhood was happy, beautiful childhood. We were, we had music constantly. There was music, we were singing. My mother played the piano. I played some piano. My mother was a great singer. My father would dance with me. There was laughter. There, there was, I had a very happy childhood. And, but then yes, there were times when they would remember and they would tell stories. And, and it was my mother who told my father about his wife, his parents, his little daughter in the ghetto, because my father was away. So I heard those stories all the time. And it was in the 1990s when I interviewed, I believe it was the 90s, when I interviewed my parents and it's in Hungarian, I have a tape. And yes, the Shoah Foundation reached out to, uh, to my mom, but the day that somebody contacted her, at that time my mom was already about in her 80s. She said, not now, can you call me another time? As she was getting older, she was getting, she was remembering more and more of the past. And sometimes she would get sad about everything that happened. Unfortunately, they never called her back. So the only interview is what I have with my parents. And the only reason I published the book is because I'm so troubled by the anti-Semitism and the hatred going on today. I, um, I think my experience was more like Guri's experience because my parents never really spoke about anything. And my uh, parents were in the Ludge ghetto and that's, and I thought it was like Anna Tefka from Fiddler on the Roof until I started writing my books. And my books are historical fiction because of the fact that I just really did not know so much. And I have tremendous guilt because of that. And I've learned so much from this group and I'm just very impassioned by what I've heard from all these presentations. Thank you, Jeffrey, very much for inviting me. I appreciate sure. it. And I wanted to call out, I wanna be, I'm honoring that you come to our presentations. Ruth Linderman, raise your hand there so everyone can see you. Devorah uh, Caspi, Devorah Caspi, uh, there she is. And uh, Jackie Gamash, if you can show us your uh, camp, get your camera on, I wanna say hello to you. And both of you, all three of you are child survivors. Uh, we also had Nathan Diamet on earlier from Israel. Um, so uh, you wanted to say something, Ruth. So please take the mic. Yes, and... I, I just wanted to tell Eva, well, I, I, I thought it would be a question, but I, I, after listening to all of this, uh, your, your mother's story may not be unique, but it is certainly one of the most unusual because of her recipe. I mean, it's historic, what she did. Uh, it, it's just a phenomenal, um, well, it, it, it's, a, it's a phenomenal effort that she made and that she was able to succeed in saving them. Yes. Uh, a real heroine. And I know you're very proud of her, but I just want you to know that I've, I had a lot of wonderful feelings about your mother. She's thank you so much, Ruth. Thank you. History. I'm okay. sorry. Say it again. Could, sorry. If what I was could, the very could, last words that you said, Ruth? Her accomplishments deserve a, a big part in, in history. Thank that, you. This is a very uh, historic uh, effort, and it it needs to be documented. And I'm I'm so happy that you've got to write the book about it. Thank you so much. And Jackie? 
Yes, uh, first of all, congratulations to the two of you, or the three of you, all of you, because Jeffrey, it's beautiful, Guri, it's fantastic, and Eva, and those life stories uh, have to be an educational tool, and we have to convert them into educational tool. You talk about anti-Semitism, and anti-Semitism was for thousands of years all over the world, but we are getting also another direction, which is racism. And uh, I, I, I feel a responsibility, and I'm sure you all do, to try to, through the stories that we hear, and, and the communion on these stories, uh, we have to provide, like Evizel was saying, a better world. And we have the responsibility of that. Well, I also want to, uh, you give Thank me, you. you're giving me the opening, Jackie, to let everyone know that you're going to be participating in a program in September. Uh, you've been involved in a tremendous project that I know Guri also has, has contributed to. So take like one or two minutes. We have time to mention the, mention the, pro, the project and the film and anything else you want to say. You have about three minutes. Well, okay, uh, thank you for that. Uh, let me start by saying that I have been an educator for 63 years in many fields. I taught physics, chemistry, mathematics, blah, and I'm dot, dot, dot. I was born in Tunisia where our identity as Jews was primarily Arab Jews. That means even if we had programs, even if we had a horrific situation with the Muslim in those countries, we, and I'm doing it fast, we did not have a Holocaust. A Holocaust as defined in the United States or in Europe, where they use more the term Shoah than Holocaust. That means uh, when I start, to, I moved to France and I went to Israel and I went to America, I became very, very um, motivated, I would say, to learn and to understand what is the Holocaust and what are those horrors. I, I see today with a project that I developed that I title, We Are the Tree of Life. And I will explain Prince and Middle Earth, which is be generated with the Pittsburgh massacre of the synagogue, the Tree of Life. And finally, put together by my granddaughter, who was then nine years old, and explained to me, and I will let you be curious until September about that, and explained to me what is survival through one drawing of a tree that I called, we are the tree of life. That means it's a generation to generation project. It's dealing with the, resilience, the courage, even the survival when they perish of inmates in ghettos, in camp concentration, who have sealed their, who have used their own skills to create their survival, even if they perish. They were musicians, they were poets, they were artists, they were, they were, it was a piano at Auschwitz, it was an orchestra, uh, Auschwitz, that means, and I wonder in the world of today, I said, we all have those incredible deep pains into our hearts when we see what's happening in the world today. And at the same time, we realize, and I will take any example, I, by the way, I don't do any politics, no left, no right, no middle, whatever. But if you take the example of Ukraine, I was saying at the beginning of the session that my daughter organized a fundraising for Ukraine, I was looking at those 10, 15 women with their children around them, holding them. The kids were grabbing their legs and grabbing their belly when they left their husbands, maybe to disappear or maybe to come back or to rebuild a family. How do those mothers can feel. That means I see today my obligation. I, I will say my obligation. It's to be dedicated to the large world of the world of today by using the lesson of the Holocaust. And you did the best example 
today. Now, just to finish with another aspect of what I have done, I have done testimonies for the Shoah Foundation of Jews from the Arab countries. For example, I have the testimony of Judah Pearl, the mother of Danielle Pearl, and uh, telling her the story of her life in when she was in Baghdad. That means we are together, we have to work together, we have to keep our own identity and culture. Eva, thank you for the recipes of food. It's beautiful, but we have to keep it in harmony with each other. I even don't like very much, I might explain it next time, the Sephardim, the Ashkenazim, you know, we need to see ourselves as one, or at least I will try to do that for myself. Thank but you. thank you for all. Thank you, Jackie. And I know, you. Um, I know uh, we have someone else. I'm looking for you. Uh, Jeanette, are you there with a question? Thank you. Yep. Okay. Is there any other buddy, anybody else interested in asking any questions or bringing up? Curry, did you? Did you uh, want yes, to I wanted to interject a comment here, a little bit responding to what Mark said, but also to what Jackie said. Um, yes, my mother never told the story and I heard only bits and pieces, but my father did. And the way he did was very interesting to me because I call it a generation skipping way to tell the story. Uh, because for a long time, I did not ask him, but the person that did ask him was my daughter, which was his granddaughter. So grandchildren, like in Jackie's case, uh, react a little bit different and they take, it, they take it more personally and they are very interested. So my daughter was very interested in his story and what he, because we live in the US and he lives in Israel, what he did, he was writing her a letter. Every month a letter came, handwritten, uh, probably six, seven, eight pages, neatly written hand, uh, letters like that. We probably have 15 letters like this altogether uh, we, it's about 150, 180 pages handwritten about his life story during the Holocaust. And of course, we made a book out of that. We called it Letters to Ifrat, which is the name of my daughter. And out of that, I learned the story of my father's survival. Some of it is in my book. Okay, thank you. And I want to call out, hello, Rich. It's nice to have you with us. This is uh, Rich is a friend of mine. We, we enjoy coffee together on Zoom every every Saturday. So thank you, uh, Rich, for being with you, being with us. And is there any other questions before we uh, end the program? Anything from Cape Town, Zola? I know you share music with uh, the passion of music with Gurry. So or any other from um, Devora? Anything? Go ahead. Go. You want to say no, something? No, no. I, 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 me? Is it Jackie? Uh, uh, yes. Okay, uh, I, I, will, I was wondering if it will be interesting for whoever uh, to just glance at my name in, uh, in Google and to see, uh, it might be easier to follow in, within the 45 minutes. And uh, I, I really, really appreciate the invitation. You got it. All right, everyone, thank you for a terrific, uh, another terrific program. Thank you for your, your dedication to supporting the uh, efforts that we are trying to bring digital education to a younger audience through all these platforms. I want to end this and say that you all have important stories to tell. And because of that storytelling, I can't bring it all to our programs today that you're featuring. So. I created a new platform called the Obligations of Memory uh, Podcast Network that I'm launching next month. And I am creating a uh, interview library of family stories, but not really reinventing or resurfacing uh, the camp experience, but how your parents came out of the darkness of the Shoah into the light and how it affected you and your growing up and how it affected your children. And it, I think it's, and it's becoming an amazing uh, experience for me personally to do these interviews. Um, I'm already receiving so much demand that it's exciting, but I do wanna offer everyone here the opportunity to literally get your um, uh, voices heard and recorded. You will have the, the actual recorded 
a, a program for you to use unlimited. So you have a piece of history that you can share with your children and your children's children. So if you're interested, you have my uh, direct messaging. You just ping me there. Uh, you have my email address, which is uh, Jeff at uh, Jeff G the Baker at gmail.com. And please get a hold of me. The sooner you can get a hold of me, the sooner I can schedule. And believe it or not, I'm scheduling September now. That's how many stories are coming out. So thank you very much. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Guri. Thank you, Eva. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Jeff. Thank Bye you, now. everybody. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank and you. thank you, Jeff. Very, very much, Jeff. Be well, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.